Um, on behalf of Rackspace Technology, we welcome you to our second Coffee Talk episode of the year. We hope you grabbed your coffee and are ready to dive in. For first-time attendees, this is a space where Rackspace Technology experts share perspectives, trends, and solutions on the top technology challenges for 2024. Feel free to ask any questions you may have throughout the episode in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen, and we will try and answer all of them during the Q&A. I am pleased to introduce you, do, introduce you to our two speakers today, Michael Levy, Director of Product Management, Programmatic Infrastructure, and Deepak Piswani, Senior Director of Product Management, Networking and Security. Michael and Deepak have a combined 36 years of tech experience and infrastructure and are infrastructure and security experts. So we are in for a treat. Without further ado, let's hear what they have to say about extracting IT risks and serving business continuity. All right, thank you, Alexis, I appreciate it. Um, so I'm old news, I've been at Rackspace for six years. I'm excited to introduce for the first time and televise Rackspace content, uh, my new peer, whom I really enjoy working with, Deepak. Deepak, you wanna give everyone a little bit of your background? Absolutely, thank you, Michael. Um, I'm a new kid on the block, just about five, six months here at Rackspace, about 25 years in the industry predominantly network security and data center space. Um, you know, I really enjoy doing these coffee talks. So I said, why not uh, get on here with my buddy here and, you know, get get going. Uh, we have some interesting topics for us to cover. So sit back, get your coffee, relax, and, you know, hear us out, talk about a few things, and then we'll open it up for questions. And this is a, a bi-coastal session. I'm in New York in Deep Pox in California. And because everything's better in New York, my coffee is invariably better too. So absolutely, you're dressed better too, man. You look oh, like I, a yeah, reporter. I'm it. dressed like a Cali you know, a typical Bay Area person. So I think we are dressed uh, appropriately there. There, there. there you go. There you go. So today we're going to discuss business continuity, and you know, the threat landscape out there is really crazy. One thing that's definitely good for business is that we can't separate our consumer self from our professional self. So those who have budgets to spend on measures to protect companies, they go home just like everyone else. They watch the news, they doom scroll. And it's really impossible to detangle kind of the fear mongering you hear as a consumer about things like ransomware and aggressive foreign actors. Yeah. I, I see speaking to customers that they bring those sentiments from the consumer realm and it affects their spending. So I, I wanna ask you what the threat landscape is, but with so much fear out there, I see that definitions are kind of fuzzy and it's an opportunity to redefine or refine definitions that of words that we've been, concepts we've been talking about since the 1970s. So just so we can level set, you know, what I see business continuity today as, it's an amalgamation of the technology and processes that keep business going. Yeah. Regardless if it's a natural disaster, if it's a malicious third party actor or just someone internally messes up. So I wanna make sure we're talking about the same thing. And then also what you see as the threat landscape. And, and, and last thing housekeeping to mention, at Rackspace, our responsibility Deepak has our security practice and tries to generally catch things in the act. And I'm on the infrastructure side. So when an incident happens and when you know you know what hits the fan, it's my portfolio's opportunity to get things running again. So Deepak, I'll hand it over to you. What's the threat landscape? And do you agree with my definition on business? Absolutely. I mean, Michael, thanks for kicking us off. So look, Business continuity, as you said, right? Like people, we don't want people keeping up at night, right? I mean, the business should continue. And there, uh, there are two parts to it, right? As you said, we got to be proactively watching out for what can happen, which is before it happens or while it's happening. So that like, that's, that's part of my job or my responsibility here to make sure we have a very, very tight security posture. Uh, because look, we are a managed hosting provider, right? And I, I've, since I've been here, you heard me talk in many places, like 
no, let's change the definition to secure managed hosting provider. Like it needs to be foundationally inherently built into every product that, that we go and talk to our customer. Like it's that important, right? But having said that, look, the it's really important to understand the threat landscape, right? Like it's it's evolving, right? As you said, it's been there um, since since the early times when network started becoming more and more popular. But but things like you know ransomware, phishing attacks, you know advanced persistent threats. I mean, understanding the types of attacks and the threat actors. Um, for a given industry, right? Like, you know, they, they target a certain industry. It could be different for healthcare. It could be different for finance. It could be different for a, a large, uh, you know, enterprise customer in different space. And, and you got to tailor the security measures that you need to apply um, to understand these, you know, threat landscapes. So I would say, uh, first thing first, look what vertical or industry you belong to and start understanding the threat landscape. I think that that's where I would start. Yeah, and that, that makes sense. You know, the big first high profile ransomware attack, wanna cry, you know, hit healthcare. Yeah. And I know that healthcare data, I haven't seen metrics on, you know, data that's leaked in the manufacturing industry, but I know that healthcare data tends to go for a premium. Um the kind of trope that's going that you hear all the time now and i i certainly believe it um is that when it comes to ransomware for organizations of all colors and flavors yeah and i hate to say that the trope it's so overplayed but it's a matter of if of when not if um and is that really the case because in, in my world the remediation world still in our backup business, for instance, still the vast majority of restores are precipitated by human error. Some admin messes something up, it's too messy to trace what they did wrong, and it just makes sense to restore to a clean copy. Yes, we definitely see customers getting hit with ransomware. You know, We've had our own experience and at Rackspace and now have built our technical acumen and are so much more vigilant and and understand how to protect and remediate. But is it really, is this the new normal that everyone's going to be, every company is going to be affected at some point? Yes and no. And it depends, right? Like um, uh, if if you are not ahead of the curve, like I, I, we just talked about this, right? Like you got to be proactive. Uh, you have to design and plan things accordingly. Like, mm -hmm. look, we, the 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 threat actors out there um, are smart too, right? And mm -hmm. you, you you need to identify them. And first of all, you got to figure out how do you identify them, right? Which which threat actors are most relevant to any organization, right? Mm -hmm. It could range from uh, state sponsored groups. It could be organized cyber criminals, hackers, mm -hmm. to competitors, to internal employees, you know, disgruntled employees mm -hmm. who, who would be. So, so you, look, you don't, not, not necessarily everybody has to be caught up in it, but eventually everybody will be if you don't proactively block things. Like, you know, the whole concept of zero trust uh, is built on top of that, right? Like, I mean, nothing can be left open. Um, and there's zero trust, not that there is, there is trust, but there's zero trust when it comes to your, your infrastructure, your, your environment, because uh, you don't know where, where some of these things are going to come in from. So uh, each actor have different capabilities, different motives, and it could impact, uh, you know, any kind of measures that you take. So, yeah, I would say it depends. And the answer is yes and no. Yes, uh, you'll be if you don't take the measures. No, and you can really harden your posture uh, by taking the right measures. As long as you understand what the threat, threat actors are, you identify them and you know the threat landscape. So you got to got to educate yourself and be proactive about things. You know, I, I don't have the familiarity with the security space or the acumen that you have, but I do know I, I've come across some really interesting um, offensive cybersecurity tools that basically can simulate yeah. a persona, whether it's a state actor 
or a disgruntled individual in their basement who's trying to destroy the world just or just wants to see the world burn. Um, and then also how they would attack you based on that specific vertical. And luckily there are new technologies like that out there, but you know, I can tell you from my conversations with customers on the remediation front, who they're most concerned about. They are most concerned about actors, whether they're individuals or the states themselves of sanctioned nations, because then you end up in a legal quagmire. And that's what I've garnered from all this is that, you know, you have the attack, you can try to stop it in the act, you can try to remediate, but then the subsequent legal activities and hurdles are really complicated because, you know, it's illegal in most nations to pay ransom to a sanctioned country or an individual in a sanctioned country. And from what I'm seeing and what I'm reading is that a significant portion of this malware of you know the encrypting of both production environments and backup are coming from these click farms in these nations. So that's something that you know when I speak to customers in a private room, you know it's not a conference or anything. That is what they're most you know the last thing they want is like attack me, but please don't be from a sanctioned country because then it gets ever more complicated. So totally, totally, and you know there there are ways. There are ways um, to mitigate uh, those attacks, uh, those mm -hmm. vulnerabilities, um, and and you can you can look at it two folds, right? One is how do you mitigate first, mm -hmm. take that measure, but let's say you're attacked, right? And then how do you still try and meet those compliances or you know those standards and checks and certifications that you need, like you know especially let's let, if you talk about like we've been talking about healthcare industry, you have to meet certain uh, standards, right? And you, you, it's not generally a check on the box, but it's actually if you're audited and if you're part of it, then you can actually be in trouble, right? So I would say, um, here's what I've been telling customers, right? Like I said, uh, stay up with, you know, your regular software updates, your mm -hmm. packages, your proactive, security assessments, you know, we, we have a ton of customers, ton of customers. Uh, I was talking about it this morning um, to one of them where uh, they want to buy pen testing, right? And so so just, just be able to identify and know the weaknesses because you don't know what you don't know, right? So mm -hmm. how do you mitigate those vulnerabilities? So, you know, staying staying ahead, staying prioritizing those mitigation techniques is what I think, um, you know, avoid or, you know, being exploited by those attackers and getting into the situation. And I'll talk about that uh, in a minute in terms of what, how do you adhere to those compliances and standards? But what, what do you think? Like, you know, have you and your, like when you talk to customers, we have same type of customers, but when you're building your systems, do you, do you see um, making sure from infrastructure perspective, you're meeting those goals? Yeah, definitely. You know it's table stakes to meet whatever controls the compliance standards for a regulated industry yeah. part mandating. The thing is that they're changing. Like if you take the financial services space, you know, there's been expected new FINRA regulation for a long time. And, you know, what I'm hearing in the industry is that, you know, the United States is waiting to see what happens in Europe. And there may be new, across all different industries, new requirements like having an immutable third copy. When I've spoken in front of a room full of, you know, healthcare and financial enterprise technology leaders, when I talk about some of the buzzwords that are being thrown around that do have real meanings like immutable backups, air gap backups, they don't have this implemented yet. So they're... You can one, the fear is palpable. The fear, not of the attack, but of receiving a fine for lack of compliance. Um, they are scrambling in a sense to be able to predict what the the more resilient compliance standards will be. And some of the more risk adverse entities out there 
are going above and beyond and implementing more resilient configurations like um, you know, table stakes, what's going to be table stakes for my opinion on remediation is immutability. So backups or storage snapshots with write once, read many capability. So once the point in time copy is saved or log of changes to facilitate a uh, point in time recovery, whatever it is, the point is that you can roll back in time before an incident has occurred. The thing is, is that there's different levels of investment required, right? So storage snapshots would be the lowest cost burden. Then you'll have immutable backups. Yeah. The most costly would be true active active DR, which always assumes that the production geography is rendered unavailable, whether it's some sort of geopolitical incident or natural disaster or the power grid goes down it's out. So that would be the most expensive. What companies need to do, the best thing to do, what I see, and they're doing themselves or seeking help, is conduct a business impact analysis, identify what the reputational and financial ramifications of each application going down is, and then spread your investment, reconciling everything with your finance. You're, basically, you're reconciling your financial imperatives with your risk tolerance and then doing that for every application. And then as the threat landscape changes, as your business imperatives change, your financial imperatives change, you then create a new plan. You know, what technologies you have for each application and what's the process to make sure that you can get them online. And, you know, there are a lot of inherent contradictions here. Like, if you look at the idea of an air gap from the 1970s, immutability and air gap, it's taking your data, putting it on tape and putting it underground in a mountain in Pennsylvania. In a world where the cloud exists and we're all addicted to you know, information constantly, downtime isn't acceptable. So another thing to reconcile besides your risk tolerance and you know, your financial imperatives is reconciling isolation with recovery time. So you know, what's enough isolation? Taping, you know, we can't wait for trucks to come and pick up tape. You know, having um, a mutability with worm capability is sufficient. Having a demarcation between your backup network and your production network is su sufficient. But that's at this current juncture. I think you know our customers expect this to change, and they're really concerned on what normative behavior will be, what the compliance standards, you know, are are mandating. So. You know, what What technologies, those are like the table stakes technologies I'm seeing. What, when it comes to identifying threats, catching them in the act, what, you know, I've, speaking of like tropes and cliches, the onion model and security, there are all these layers you need to be mindful of. So, you know, if I came to you and said, what's, you know, what, what do I have to invest in when it comes to like endpoint management? What, what does that look like? Yeah, no, first of all, I mean, I love, love what you walked us through. I mean, looks like, we we are doing the right way of doing it. I mean, you know, gone are the days when, as I said, you know, you tape it, you put it in the basement, forget about it. No, mm -hmm. with, with the way um, applications are deployed uh, in the cloud and the access that's needed on on a real time basis, I think that's that's what I heard you talk about. So mm -hmm. um, let's let's talk about you know the onion model or the technologies to deploy, right? I mean, as as we started. The discussion business continuity is the goal and and we want to focus on both right catching the attackers in the act and and recover post incident now you you just walked us through how do you recover like i'll tell you ideally both need to work hand in hand and have strong you know preventive measures um look what what i'm recommending all our customers is uh you know start with foundational security, right? Like basic um, IDS, um, network IDS, host-based IDS, uh, endpoint security, um, and, and have you know robust incident response and recovery uh, mechanism in place to reduce that downtime, right? Like business continuity, uh, downtime, like you know, those, those are the two opposites we are talking about, right? So to, how do you minimize that downtime and damage 
is by starting with your basic foundational security, right? Uh, again, depending on the maturity model or maturity cycle of a customer, they may already be at foundational and may have to look at the advanced security, but, but from peeling the onion perspective, that's where I'll start, right? Um, then I would, then I would usually work with them and tailor to specific security needs. Like it could be, you know, the next generation firewalls, antivirus encryption, MFA, um, the multi-factor authentication, and, and, you know, the SIM systems for real-time monitoring and response. Because again, if you want to catch it in the act and, you know, have, have the remediation uh, be put in place immediately, you need to have those same tools to be able to collect real-time monitoring. And like more recently with the announcements that we are we are hearing every day, you know, employing the AL and, you know, the, the artificial intelligence, AI and ML tools can further enhance our ability to detect and respond to threats. Like I, so what I see is a combination, right? You have the basic foundational security some advanced level on top, depending on the applications you have, you know, at the NetSec layer or the 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 WAP layer with uh, web applications and API, and then going into the monitoring uh, tools, you know, the SOC services, the SIM tools, etc., which can make sure you can you get the right information at the right time to act on it, right? So I think those a combination of those, I think, are the ones which uh, which would be the ones, the technologies I would like to deploy. You know, it's interesting you brought up embracing AI ML. One of our uh, data protection, and by that I mean backup vendors at their conference, uh, someone was speaking. And uh, for lack of a better term, they were explaining that the AI models out there that, you know, every consumer knows like ChatGPT, they're a kind of uh, bizarro versions that malicious actors have created uh to make a superman reference and you know what they're doing is they are exploiting you know educational and access vulnerabilities that vulnerable targets normally would have and that humans would be spear phishing you know for instance if i was obsessed with knitting and i received an email to join the illuminati of knitting clubs and yeah. to dot exe file i likely would um okay. now that's someone who you know stalked me and identified that on their free in their free time but now we have ai models that can identify people who are vulnerable you know think of people who are a bit older in age you know i know you know i receive uh from older people in in my family you know messages should i click on this link you know asking for you know saying yeah. that netflix is overdue so we're seeing those tactics done at an incredibly expedited pace and you know any call for a moratorium on ai is untenable because the threat actors have embraced it so yeah. we can't have the and i know i'm putting this in you know, really elementary uh, binary terms, but we, we we need to keep investing in the good, the light side AI, because the dark side AI is intensifying, right? And, 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 you know, we were just talking in a meeting, right? There are feature sets on enterprise infrastructure that you can always turn on. Everyone should turn on all the bells and whistles to be able to help, you know, anomaly protection. You're now starting to see the main enterprise OEMs introduce anomaly detection to various parts of the stack. So, you know, there are luckily tools that might already be in someone's arsenal that they could they could take, take advantage of. But yeah, definitely, I think embracing any sort of AI ML powered feature sets is important. And this is more than just a marketing buzzword, right? There really is, there really is AI functionality embedded into systems to try to keep up with the AI powered threats out there. It's a, it's a crazy, crazy world. Um, so when you were just saying all the different technologies that need to be implemented, I was thinking a risk adverse company could spend themselves into bankruptcy. Like how can someone identify what's satisfactory? How can they 
how can a CISO or a CTO or a CIO, whomever's in charge, you know, get get a few hours of good sleep and know that, you know, they have a decent security posture amid all this uncertainty? Look, I, I would start with, you know, yes, we need to be ahead of the curve, right? As you discussed, there is there's gen AI and then there's evil AI, right? Like we, we got to, we got to watch out for both. Right. Uh, but, but I would say um, your security posture um, to depends on defining clear security goals and metrics, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, have sit down and it's not about what CIO or CTO or CISO wants to do. I think it's, it's across the, the company and like every product nowadays or every service as security inherently built in. So define those um, security goals, right? I think, and, and then the metrics, right? It's not just about defining the goals, but what are the metrics? What are the KPIs that you want to measure uh, for your security? I think that's where you start. Um, you also have to, as remember, we spoke about, you need to compliant with industry standards, like as, as in any industry, am I supposed to have the ISO, let's say, uh, 27001, um, you know, adherence to meet, or am I part of the NIST frameworks or any kind of security certifications? So all that needs to be planned for. Not everybody would need to be part of it, but but you got to define those security goals, you know, and 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 the metrics, and then um, start there, right? I mean, start there to have a satisfactory or I would say bare minimum security posture, like, you know, uh, security audits can help you, a security assessment can help you define, like, where do you, where, where are some of the gaps or, you know, where is an opportunity to, to fill a gap, right? And uh, gauge the posture and see if it meets the organizational goals. I think that's, that's where a lot of our customers uh, are right now like they like don't get me wrong like you know security is there like they have built in but are they staying current with where they need to be right like I mean I think that that's that's where I would say um, they need to get started uh, you know start working start thinking about it and and go from there and it it helps them two ways right one protect them second you continue to stay competitive in the business because now you're meeting some of those standards and certifications and, and requirements from, from the governance, which is put in place. So I think it helps both ways. Excellent. Well, I, I certainly don't envy you having to make customers happy uh, when it comes to something that's really ever changing. You know, I, I, I have an infrastructure portfolio. So a, a well-managed box is a well-managed box with uh you know, some superior customer service. So uh, I definitely don't envy you. Just want to end, <laughs> end on that. So good, good luck. Um, yeah, no, I mean, uh, it's, it's you know, all about keeping your infra safe. Um, again, you know, I, I say this, uh, security is more of a horizontal service than, than yeah. a vertical. Uh, it, it touches every product um, the company or anybody wants to sell. So, so yeah, I mean, want to make sure... I keep customers' environment safe and you know avoid any attacks. Awesome. Cool. Well, thank you both, Michael and Deepak. That was some really great insight. Um, our audience do does have some questions for you about the conversation. Um, sure. Remember, you can still submit your questions in the Q and A panel on the bottom of your screen, and we will try to answer all of them. Um, so let's get started. Our first question here is: What kind of malware attack are your customers most worried about? Um, go ahead. Maybe I can start with that one. Yeah. So I, you know, I alluded to this before. They are very concerned about a ransomware attack from a sanctioned actor, an individual or the government itself. And the reason why is if they have employed a trusted ransomware remediation process with satisfactory technology, they know that they can most likely successfully restore rather quickly. Um, you know, like the, some of the technology we use um, when it comes to virtualized environments, they can restore, or at least be running within minutes, but then a restore from backup to production can take several hours. Now, 
if you as a company in the United States are suspect that you were attacked by a sanctioned act actor, you're supposed to call the FBI. Our customers are less concerned about the attack or some customers and not only not necessarily ours, they're concerned about what the response would be from the authorities. And a big concern is that their recovery gear will be taken in by the government for investigatory purposes to see which sanctioned country and whom um, are the perpetrators. And that would preclude the business from fully restoring because the boxes are gone. So that's why we're seeing wallets open up for tertiary copies for workloads that had secondary copies because if a subpoena is written to the company, it's like, hey, we need to take this in because we suspect that you were attacked by a foreign actor. You could say, well, you, you could take the primary backup, but the tertiary one, this was completely isolated from the internet. So please don't take that. Let us resume business. You know, if I looked into my crystal ball, I think the next major incident of a business going down would be from seizure and investigation of the gear rather than the attack itself because the technologies out there for remediation are pretty pretty decent, pretty good out there. And especially if you have a, a solid uh, managed service provider managing it for you, right? Your efficacy of recovery is, is pretty high. So that's what I hear is the biggest fear, whether it's founded, I'm not a legal expert, but I can tell you those are the fears that were vocalized and frustrations that are vocalized to me from customers. Awesome. Thank you so much, Michael. So we have our next question, and it's why should customers be concerned about their own government? Uh, well, I kind of just, you know, answered answered that one um, and that question. So someone was quick to uh, quick to send that out. It, it, it really is, you know, concern about not only, you know, in the uh, extreme event that there's seizure, but also they don't want to get in trouble, right? They want to make sure they, they comply. And it's honestly, the, the regulatory environment is really unclear right now. There are contradictions. You know, I've spoken to several legal experts. I've heard them speak at conferences and no one really knows what to do. So Think about it. Your business is threatened. Everything, you're trying to get everything back in line, but you also don't want to break the law in a legal landscape that is kind of uncharted and really, so that's added pressure on top of, you know, if you're a retail business, you know, how many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars you're losing out on every minute. So there is this legal aspect. And as a service provider, you know, customers are, looking to us, you know, not to be their lawyers, but to set up an infrastructure architecture that best helps them get through um, the, the, the subsequent legal activity. And then Deepak, you mentioned like anybody can go rogue, even, you know, an internal person. Yeah. The immutability that we're employing, for instance, not even we nor the OEM could delete these backups. Once they're written, they are there, unchangeable until their retention period expires, right? So that prevents a malicious actor from coming in and re-encrypting, which is what ransomware is, and then saying, hey, give us a whole bunch of money to get the encryption key, right? Awesome, thank you, Michael. And we have one last question. It's, is there a specific technology that's for network security, endpoint security, or application security? Ah, great. Uh, I'll take that one. Uh, well, there is, but may not be sufficient for to cover everything, right? Like uh, that, that used to be the case um, the years ago, right? I mean, back, I would say, uh, I'm aged now, like, you know, I've been in industry for 25 plus years. That used to be the case, like put a firewall, things behind the firewall and, and done. Well, uh, that's no longer possible, right? I mean, given 
um, there are no boundaries of what where an endpoint can be, right? It could be, you know, in the office, it could be remote, it could be all over the place, right? And and so we don't know where um, an entry and exit point is. There, there, there are no defined boundaries anymore. So, so yeah, I would say not anymore, given the landscape we are in, uh, where, you know, it could be on-prem, it could be hybrid, cloud, multi-cloud, uh, it, 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 you have to deploy certain specialized endpoint security measures, network security measures, and web application measures. I would say um, there is a bit of overlap some places, uh, but I would say no. <laughs> you can't have one technology doing all, and you have to go and deploy a specific one for each of these. And make sure there's a wrapper of monitoring around it to get timely reports and timely uh, details to go and either act or remediate uh, what's what's happening. So I think um, that that that's what I would say. Um, the where the industry and as a as a whole we have evolved with with applications users being all over the place. So. All right. Thank you all so much. Um, thank you all for your questions and for joining this episode. Um, you know, if you have any more questions, uh, you can always fill out this form. We're going to put a QR code on the screen now, which you can scan. And I will also put a link in this chat so that we can continue the conversation. Um, so I am sending that through right now. And again, thank you all for those who attended. And thank you so much, Michael and Deepak, for being our speakers extraordinaires. And see you on this next episode. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye. Yeah.